early to middle Triassic was a key time of diversification for many animals, especially the archosaurs. This time period would see the origin of the dinosaurs and crocodilians within the archosaurs, along with many other lineages. Some rocks dating to this time outcrop in Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, and California, but the exposures in northern Arizona of the Mankapi Formation are among the most richly fossil bearing in North America, which doesn't mean a lot. The fossil record in the Mankapi Formation is fairly sparse, but fossils, even large fossils like Arizonasaurus babidi, have been found there. Based on its size, Arizonasaurus would have been the top predator around at this time. It would have been about 3 meters long, or around 10 feet, so it could be compared to the modern day Komodo dragon, but with a few distinct traits. One being the obvious massive sail on its back, and another it was more upright. Archosaurs and squamates, squamates being lizards like the Komodo dragon, have significant differences in their hips. These differences allowed archosaurs to walk more upright, meaning they could be more active in their environment, leading to 180 million years of complete land domination, first as the Pseudosuchians, things closer related to crocodilians, and then the dinosaurs. And Arizona was one of these Pseudosuchians, specifically a poposaurid. This is on the basis of its and other animals' shared traits, like the ischium pubis contact just not existing, because there was less of a margin on the ilium, and basically just the hips weren't as connected as you might expect. The sacral vertebra also were being fully fused into the hips, it had a thinner pubic boot on the pubis, and it didn't have any osteoderms. Osteoderms are one of the most important traits to most pseudosuchians. In the herbivorous aetosaurus, for example, they were massive and expanded into these large spikes that they would have used for competition. And even the largest predatory rawasuchians, like Postosuchus, would have had some form of osteoderms, these bones growing inside of the skin. The poposauroids, though, don't despite being one of the earliest Pseudosuchian groups, and having relatives on both sides of their evolutionary branch, which do have osteoderms. So it's really unique that they don't. This didn't really affect their success, however, with the Poposaurids surviving until the end of the Triassic period, even alongside their larger and often osteoderm-bearing relatives like the Rawasuchians. And the loss of those osteoderms might have actually been the cause of Arizonasaurus's most distinctive feature, its sail. Osteoderms have been suggested to have evolved as protection from predation, and at least in some animals, like the armored aetosaurs and ankylosaurs, they almost certainly serve that function some of the time, although it also seems like they may have been more for protection from other individuals of the same species when competing for mates. However, it's also been suggested that osteoderms serve a very important thermoregulation role, meaning essentially they help control the temperature that the body is at. This is still being debated in the literature, but if tested well, Arizonasaurus may actually serve as a great case study for this. And there is work coming on this based on one student's presentation at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting in 2023. And I say that it may support this idea, it still needs to be fully verified and published on, but basically, hey, what kind of blood vessels were going through the sale? And maybe it could have been used for warmth, but also maybe it was display. Interestingly though, we can look at the other poposauroids and try and get some idea, and it's really hard to know, because some have sails, like the herbivorous Lotosaurus. Others, like the carnivorous Poposaurus, lost the sail, despite potentially being even more active than Arizonasaurus and still predatory. So the case of why it had a sail is still in the open. Hopefully the study that I mentioned earlier will be published soon, because I think it could add a lot to this discussion but it still wouldn't answer a ton about what Arizonasaurus was doing, or how it lived in its environment. Arizonasaurus was, again, from what we know, the largest predator in its environment, and that environment could have been pretty diverse. The Mongkapi Formation was deposited during the Sonoma Orogeny, an orogeny just being a mountain building event, and this is basically what built the western side of North America, and just to the east of the newly built mountains you would find this big basin. Essentially, as the collision built the mountains nearer the coast, the crust behind the mountains crumpled and bent downwards, making this basin rich with opportunity for deposition of new rocks and for fossilization. And it wasn't just a little basin in northern Arizona. It stretched from parts of northern Mexico into parts of Canada, but just later geology and other mountain building means a lot of this has been poorly studied. Still, a lot of the newer research has suggested that the sand that made these rocks from the area were deposited from the early to the middle Triassic, and that's based on the edges of zircons that are found in the sediments. 
Zircons are a mineral which is pretty resistant to erosion and, really importantly, contains uranium from cooling magma, which means zircons in the sands and muds of the Mong Kupi Formation can be used to set an upper age limit. Basically, it can't be any older than this because we have zircons that are that old in it. This means that the sediment cores from Petrified Forest National Park are about as close to an accurate age as we're likely to get, and the Mung Kapi formation in those cores was found to have an age maximum of 250 million years ago, with at least some of the last part of the formation being deposited as late as 240 million years ago, with 0% of grains dating to after that age. So it really shows the world only 12 million years after the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, the worst mass extinction in history, and that's the world Arizonosaurus would have lived in. And it lived very successfully. Abundant trackways in the Monkopi Formation have been documented throughout its outcroppings, and some even come from newly constructed buildings in Flagstaff, Arizona, and collected by Museum of Northern Arizona. I... Maybe I can go visit those. In fact, they're so abundant that a report was made just a few years ago on their occurrences in Wapatki National Monument, with many of the tracks being so good that they're preserving the scale pattern of the maker, which, as far as we know, based on their size, has to have been Arizonosaurus, as there's no other track makers near that size in the Mankabi Formation. And even with that extensive look at the formation, no dinosauriform three-toed tracks have been found, meaning at least early on in North America, there were exceedingly few dinosaurs in the region. Instead, their relatives, the Pseudosuchians, would dominate, and that includes Arizonosaurus. Arizonosaurus is currently known from two published specimens, although there is at least one other specimen that, as far as I know, hasn't been collected yet. Their rarity speaks to the poor fossil record in the early and middle Triassic in North America. We know a lot of animal groups had to have been around, though, based on how diverse later Triassic deposits are, and from the genetic records of groups diverging from one another throughout the early and middle Triassic. It's just that they're very rarely preserved. But there's enough to piece together a pretty basic ecosystem. The red beds of the Mon Kapi Formation mean exposure to air, and that means essentially there is iron in the rock that oxidized and turned into rust. Looking at some locations, you can see pretty clear channels, like this one off of Route 66 in Flagstaff, Arizona. Those stream channels would have held coelacanths, lungfish, and even sharks based on the types of teeth found in those channels. But sharks probably weren't even the top predators in the water. Wellsaurus and Eocyclotosaurus were temnospondyls, amphibian relatives, and they would have been present in the waterways and reached pretty good size, likely being even more dominant of predators than the other fish that would have been around in those river systems. There's also tracks and isolated fossils suggesting that the lizard-like Trilophosaurs, like Anisodontosaurus, would have been wandering the land in between these rivers just like Arizonosaurus. But it wouldn't just be things smaller than Arizonosaurus in the Munkapi Formation. While it is the best known archosaur from the formation, some regions, including a site in eastern New Mexico, preserve fossils of other archosauriform predators. None of these are complete enough to name, but they were present and likely around the size of Arizonosaurus. But from what we can tell in earlier group, the erythrosuchids, as opposed to the poposaurids. The erythrosuchids were a group of archosauriforms which broke off before key archosaurian traits evolved. Born having toe bones that are flattened, and this likely helped them later paddle, but at this point these kind of crocodilian relatives weren't paddling through the water quite as often. Another set of fragmentary material from the same region is probably from Arizonosaurus or another Pobosaurid, but again, not described, so it's hard to say for sure. It could very well be that Arizonosaurus was more common in the environment than currently known, and that it's just due to the limitations of where the Moan Kopi is, and that it doesn't preserve fossils often. Across the outcrops in California and Nevada, it's mostly hot desert and super remote, meaning you'd have to pack a ton of resources to go look for the fossils, which may or may not even be preserved in that part of the Mungkapi Formation. Other swaths of the formation lie on the Navajo and Hopi nations, who have been resistant to research in recent years due to poor respect for the land by some, but by no means all research groups who have looked for fossils in the Mungkapi Formation. Still, Arizonosaurus is one of the only known Middle Triassic terrestrial predators in North America, and its very unique features, like that sail, show how rapidly the archosaurs diverged from one another. Archosaurs today include the crocodilians and the living dinosaurs, the birds. Genetic studies suggest that the crocline archosaurs, the pseudosuchians, and the birdline archosaurs, the dinosaurs, split off from one another during the early Triassic, and here, only 10 million years later, is Arizonosaurus, 
a clearly very, very different animal than whatever the last generic common ancestor between the two groups would have been. It wasn't small like Euparkaria, arguably the first archosaur, or the long-necked forms like the Prolacerata forms. It also had time to evolve a loss of osteoderms and this massive sail. Arizonosaurus was a derived Pseudosuchian, not just some weird early form that hadn't undergone a ton of change. It was unique and very well adapted to its environment. Unfortunately, that's all we can say, which can also be said about basically any animal, that it's adapted to its environment. And this is an environment that was in transition between the erythrosuchids and the large temnospondyls of the early Triassic, and the pseudosuchian turtle, dinosaur, and the maliform faunals of the late Triassic. And just applying other poposaurs to Arizonosaurus isn't a perfect comparison either. Poposaurus would have been predatory, sure, but Lotosaurus and Ephigia were herbivorous, with Ephigia even being convergent on the Ornithomimid dinosaurs of the Cretaceous over 60 million years later. So Arizonosaurus was eating meat, but we still have no kind of idea what it might have been, if it was a generalist eating everything, or if it was more specialized. Or even potentially how it was hunting. Was it chasing down prey? Was it lying in wait in ambush? We don't know. In fact, some of the first work on Pseudosuchians and their predatory habits has only just started, and mostly in Riohasuchus, from an even earlier branch of the Pseudosuchians. And Riohasuchus had a really weird skull, which helped lead them to being studied, but not in Arizonosaurus, which has kind of a more typical skull shape. Poposaurus, though, at least has one specimen with good legs preserved, and a lot of work has been done on the musculature of those legs, and it clearly would have been bipedal, which is something that doesn't seem likely in Arizonosaurus, on the basis of the forelimbs being better built to support weight, and also on those large trackways the Moncoffee formation showing a quadrupedal gait for whatever was making them. The Lazipoposaurus, though, do tell us how Arizonosaurus might have breathed, though, with an ischiotruncus muscle meaning basically connected to the gastralia, the belly ribs of the animal, to the ischium, one of the bones in the pelvis, and then to the back of the lungs. And that muscle's contraction would have pumped the chest of the animal open and closed, allowing it to breathe, although that may be limited to being bipedal, which doesn't seem like Arizonosaurus seems it was, but at least Poposaurus was. So we still need more study on Arizonosaurus to really know that for sure. But again, we can start telling really specific things about these animals. And just for Arizonosaurus, there's a lot that needs to be done. I'd especially love more functional work done to understand how it lived, and potentially for more material of it from the long copy formation to be described so that we can better understand how it would have lived in its environment. Or for even more material from the early Triassic to be found so we can understand where it came from and what evolutionary trajectories led to Arizonosaurus, which I think, as I've shown, is a pretty unique animal. But that work hasn't been done yet, and while it's exciting that there's so much work to be done, it's also frustrating that there's so much work to be done. Hopefully a deeper look at the monk copy formation will happen, and then we can finally start to resolve more of the questions about what Arizonosaurus was and what it was doing in its environment. Hey everyone! Oh, my feet! Thanks for watching. Um, hopefully you have two new papers coming out soon, and then another one that's, I don't know about soon, but in the works. Lots of stuff going on in the world of paleontology. I got to touch the holotype of Tyrannosaurus micriensis, which is really neat. Um, so that's a project that's also being worked on. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Paleontology is fun. You should go study it once there's funding. That's it, everyone. Feel free to check out the Patreon. We're going to try and start catching up on these videos a lot more. Just recorded three of them just now. So that's promising. Um, with that said, everyone, be safe. Take care. Don't go extinct.